Every year, there's always one script that I write, voice over, and begin editing, and then I realize, wow, this script is awful. I can do better than this. Last year, or I guess 2019, it was the video that put me on the map, the video where I criticized Yandere Simulator, and accidentally set off a flood of crit videos for a game that really isn't anything special beyond how creepily pedophilic and weebish the game is thanks to its pedo weeb developer. This year, it's going to be tied to another two-parter video, but this is a planned two-parter, and it's going to be something that I adore, Danganronpa. A series that's received notoriety in recent years and is the cornerstone of my channel, which you wonderful regular viewers already know. It has compelling mysteries, thought-provoking themes, and absolutely amazing characters. Even its worst minor characters have a bit of meat to their bones, even when they don't get very much screen time, and many who don't see much screen time are still very fleshed out. Most characters feel like real people you'd encounter in the real world. However, in a pantheon of outstanding characterization, there's one character that sticks out, for all the wrong reasons. Somewhere along Kokichi Oma's conception, something fucked up, or perhaps everything fucked up, and we're left with a character frantically copying from characters before him. Not only that, but he fails to copy over what made these characters compelling. And somehow this character is heralded as the best written character in the entire series? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are you out of your mind? Before I get Kokichi fans swarming my mentions insisting I've got to be completely brainless for not believing he's God walking the earth once more, I graduated university in June 2020 with a Bachelor of Creative Industries. My two majors? Video games design and creative writing. I also completed all of the classes in the interactive narrative minor as my electives. I'm not going to claim that I'm the greatest writer of all time because of these qualifications, but I do know more than a fan still in high school or studying something else, and I've studied this topic quite extensively. It was through these classes that I came to realize I failed a lot of with my characterization in my fanga on Danganronpa S. However, one can learn more from failure than from success. So long as that failure is actually acknowledged as failure. Kokichi Oma is acknowledged as a god among Danganronpa, but he's not a god. He's not great. He's not even a passable character. Kokichi Oma is terrible. I'm convinced people are taking the piss when they say he's the best character in the series. I think fans mistake me, however, hating his actions in-game. That's not it. My issue is how they're written. If Kokichi were written well, I think I'd at least tolerate him, if not actually enjoy him. But a video where I only complain about Kokichi for 30 minutes? That's gonna tire me out very fast, and it's a far cry from my old ideology of video creation, which is to shine lights on underrated or forgotten things. Chapter 3 of V3, Akane Owari, Sayaka Maizuno, Kirumi Tojo, all are things that fit this ideology of mine. There's a character that I believe not only could have easily fulfilled Kokichi's role of the rival or antagonist character in Danganronpa V3, but should have, that fits within this video-making philosophy of mine. That character is Anji Yonaga. Anji Yonaga was a solid character. Despite all of the anti-Polynesian writing with her character, her island and its traditions, Anji had a lot more intrigue with her character. There's actually a character to dig into. Plus, she'd be a really unique take on the rival archetype and the logical step up from Nagito Kamida. He's a fanatic for hope. She's a literal fanatic for God. I'll try not to discuss what we could have had because we didn't get it, regrettably but I will talk about what we did get and why she should have been Kamida's successor. And finally, before we begin, I don't want to attack or hurt people who like Kokichi. There's no hard feelings if you like Kokichi, but I do think you're misguided if you think he's well-written. I hate him though, so if you feel like this might be a hurtful video to go through, I recommend clicking off and finding something else to watch. I know he's a comfort character for a lot of you, but he enrages me. A lot of this is indeed my view of the situation, I just also have a $100 microphone, video editing software, wide audience, aforementioned university degree, and a corrupted black hole that absorbs all genders that get too close to its gaping maw to amplify my views like a pissed off orangutan to the internet. What makes a good character can be quite subjective. While researching how best to approach this, I found a bunch of web articles that said, good characters need to be dependable, they need to be loyal, and I wondered if I was asking the wrong question. But no, it was the internet that was wrong. It thought when I asked what makes a good character, I was asking what makes a character a good person. And I think a lot of Kokichi fans make the same mistake when I say that he's a terrible character. Then I finally came across this article, and I found what I was searching for. It's from seven years ago, but it's still quite relevant. 
I'll simplify it as best I can so that we're not here for six hours and create a set of five rules. Good characters need persona, agency, motive, wants and fears, and conflicts and connections. This is a good rule of five to start with and at least build a solid foundation. So let's grab Kokichi and see what he has. Number one, persona. Kokichi does indeed have a persona. He's a conflict starter. He's intelligent and analytical. He behaves completely unhinged towards the others and enjoys making the mysteries harder for his classmate. Wait a second. Oh boy, Kokichi Oma. It's like Nagito Kamida, but plus another one. Now, I know that people argue that you shouldn't compare them because they're not the same. The issue is, yeah, they kind of are. They fulfill the exact same role as each other, not just as the rival to Hajime or Shuichi, who despite doing the same things in their games do feel like two distinct characters, but in being the quote unquote crazy character who makes life harder for everybody else by being a problem, and treating the protagonist like shit during the main story, only to turn around and say, I love you in the end of their free time events. Same show! Same show! But not only is Kokichi a clone of Nagito, he's an inferior clone with none of what made Nagito interesting. For one, in terms of design, Nagito has pops of color that make him quite interesting to look at, with contrasting colors. He's decked out in green, associated with luck thanks to the four leaf clover. Kokichi is black, white, purple, white. Not only that, but say what you will about Nagito being a bad portrayal of a mentally ill character, but if you're taking the mentally ill angle with Kokichi, they literally put him in a straitjacket. Nagito at the very least avoided that. Nagito's actions in the narrative were never excused and glossed over, nor were they made out to be purely evil. His actions were laid bare for the player to decide whether they were good, evil, or even somewhere in between, which is where I think he lies. His unhinged behavior came from the fact that his brain was literally deteriorating. He had both stage three malignant lymphoma and frontotemporal lobe dementia. And he needed literally anything to believe him to give him even the slightest will to exist. His writing portrayed him as an intelligent, analytical, and someone you can struggle to empathize with and will never be able to fully do so. And yet, you can still come to understand why he thinks the way he does. His ideology makes sense, bearing in mind what in life he's had to deal with. Kokichi so clearly copies the Nagito formula established before, without copying over any of what made him a compelling or interesting character. Kokichi makes only a few superficial changes in personality, such as being more childish in behavior and the narrative saying that he has some more morality than Nagito, rather than showing us. But the lack of morality and his extreme ideological perspective was what made Nagito interesting. Taking them away and replacing them with he's childish, prankster, loves his 10 friends, no killing, wound up shooting any interesting characterization that Kokichi could have had in the foot. Kokichi has no consistent persona of his own. He steals most of his personality from Nagito, and the changes added are completely superficial. If this helps you understand, here's a metaphor. Nagito is Shrek. Kokichi is Shark Tail. Number two, agency. Kokichi has a plethora of agency. You see, whenever he wants something done, he makes someone else do it. Usually Gondro Shuichi, sometimes Miyu. And when he can't do that anymore, he dies! Jokes aside, while Kokichi gets a bit of agency, managing to stumble onto important plot points by luck, further illustrating that they should have just made him the super high school level luck rather than all this supreme leader little bastard nonsense, for the role he's meant to play, his agency is all over the place. As the plot goes on, his actions feel like the story is bending to suit his will to an insulting degree. I can suspend my disbelief pretty far. A book that plays God, a VR game that can kill you, a teenage girl being the de facto prime minister, that's all stuff that I can generally believe can indeed happen. But a lot of the stuff that Kokichi does, especially in later chapters, that's where the bullshit he was getting away with was starting to get so unrealistic it was bringing me out of the story. In chapter four, he managed to manipulate Gonta, who by this point, even he knew Kokichi wasn't to be trusted, and butchered his characterization in order to get him to kill somebody so that Kokichi could survive. They made Gonta act out of character to serve Kokichi, and it's obvious that they couldn't think of another way to get him out of being murdered by Miu which would have been a more interesting chapter four, don't at me. And in chapter five, Kokichi is not only holding Kaito hostage, but he is holding the plot hostage. And after that mess of a trial, 
Kokichi's role isn't really brought up that much in the final trial, nor anything he actually did. Everything that happens in the trial is Shuichi's deductions, Rentaro's information, and Samugi's crime actually catching up to her. Kokichi's agency doesn't serve the story, the story serves him. He controls the plot even when he really shouldn't be. In chapters 4 and 5, the universe begins to contort and serve him in ways it just didn't before. Nothing at all suggests he should be smart enough to solve these mysteries. He, he just knows because... Byakuya and Nagito were rich and lonely dicks with enough time on their hands to go read intriguing files. Kokichi isn't that, even though he clearly needed to be to make sense. So without the context Byakuya and Nagito bring and relying on his own context, how does Kokichi know any of the story beats would happen? The game never explains. Not beyond, Oh, Kokichi is just such, such a big monster, dog, galaxy, breaking and visual that he already knew it would come up. And he knew the mastermind and the reality of the killing game and stuck his dick. Number three, motive. This is where Kokichi really starts to fall apart. Everyone thinks his motive is really good, right? I even asked what everyone thought his motive was. And overwhelmingly, I was told, end the killing game. And that's fine, pretty boring. Every character wants this in one form or another, but it's fine. There's just one issue. It's not a motive. It's a goal. Kokichi has no motive at all. A goal is what your character wants to achieve, and a motive is why they want to achieve their goal. Ask yourself this. Why does Kokichi want to end the killing game? An answer probably didn't come to mind immediately, and for those who did come up with a motive, the motive was probably, it's the right thing to do. But what makes for a good person may not make for a good character. A good character compels you to think, even if ultimately you disagree with their viewpoints. It's the right thing to do as a motive for end the killing game is a no shit Zaihara motive. For all the smoke and mirrors, all of the lies obscuring Kokichi's true intentions, to learn that those intentions are almost non-existent and completely bland is astonishingly horrible writing. Like. This is your primary antagonist. He carries the conflict for five chapters, and he's got no motive. His goal is basic, his actions don't serve his goal, his motive is almost non-existent, and his actions do not serve that either. Once you dig past all of the lies, there's nothing compelling underneath that. A character having no motive means they have no ideology. No ideology means no method of action. No method of action is a death sentence for what little you might have. Personality, goals, wants, fears, connections, conflicts, it's all meaningless. Imagine if Monokuma had been providing all of these mysteries for the entire game, and then when it came time to reveal the mastermind, the mastermind was a stack of pancakes. Dollar store, box can pancakes. That were burnt. And still half batter. But the mastermind is already basically the stack of pancakes. <laughs> Number 4. Wants and Fears Here's another segment where Kokichi falls apart, but not quite so badly. Kokichi's wants are basic and... existent. He wants to end the killing game. Nothing he does actually lines up with this want, but he has one want. He gets a knee here. But he has no real fears. He doesn't fear dying. He doesn't fear being alone. He doesn't fear being despised by all of his classmates. He doesn't even seem to fear the idea that the killing game could continue. Which, you know, if his want is to end it, then his fear should be that. I guess he fears being considered boring, but I'm not an ingenuity of God and an uwu soft dembi who never did anything wrong because I'm afraid to be boring. There's one instance where we see Kokichi scared. When Gonto learns Kokichi lied to him, he locks Kokichi in his lab to make friends with all of the insects. That's the only time we see Kokichi genuinely scared at all. That doesn't qualify as an actual fear that follows him around in everyday life during the killing game. It's the consequences for being a dick, and bugs are a pretty common phobia that we just saw, so... <laughs> Number 5. Conflicts and Connections Kokichi is no stranger to conflict. Most major conflicts in the game are indeed his fault. It's hard to remove Kokichi from the story and have the same story. So that means he's good in this department, right? No. No, he isn't. 
every conflict that happens is a result of his hubris and believing he only his solution of going it alone and won't rely on others is the way to stop the killing game. In the end, his solutions involve getting Mew and Gon to kill directly, and indirectly also result in Ryoma and Kurumi dying. And it also results in him and Kaito dying. Half of the chapter's murders wouldn't have happened if he'd just shut up and cooperated with everybody. All he did was accelerate conflict. This would be excellent if Kokichi's character supported this and wasn't at complete odds with itself. You might be thinking, didn't you say that Kokichi frequently relied on others to do his dirty work? That's the opposite of going it alone. To that I say, correct! What little substance does exist for Kokichi contradicts itself. He goes it alone and never relies on others, but relies on Gonta and Shuichi to do anything for most of his screen time. He wants to end the killing game and will never kill, but uses loopholes to kill once Mew and Gonta outlive their usefulness for them. He's an intelligent, ever-evolving master of the game who wants to save everybody, until he fails to change tactics when one is clearly not working and continuously puts everyone not only at odds against him, but at each other, lowering their odds of survival. Kokichi is until he isn't. Kokichi Oma is in constant contradiction with himself. In having no ideology, no method of action, no motive, a flimsy goal, a stolen persona, unclear wants and fears, ever-changing relationships that have forgotten when the narrative needs them to be, and overall being a complete unstable mess, they fail to include the one thing that every other character has. Yes, even Hifumi. Yes, even Teru Teru. Yes! Even Haiji Toa! Humanity! Kokichi Oma has no humanity as a character, despite the fact the game obviously wants you to view him as such. He lacks the core elements of a human being, but not in a well-written way like Junko, Nagito, or Peko, where they're replaced with a compelling, relevant, and ultimately still anthropomorphic theme. Junko's flesh is indeed human. Her emotions and desires whilst completely unconventional, showcase that she is, fundamentally, human. Nagito's flesh is indeed human. His ideology about hope and the joy that he can experience and dispense with its power, while completely unconventional, showcase that he is, fundamentally, human. Peko's flesh is indeed human. She does not see herself as such due to her upbringing, but the care she takes in those around her is still fundamentally human. Kokichi completely lacks a humanizing element. He is just an anthropomorph of Shuichi's opposing theme. He's a cartoon villain, a generic YA dystopian villain, vague and mysterious to avoid actually having to flesh out his character. He isn't human, which is, I'm sure we can all agree, where Danganronpa characters are at their best. Where even past all of the theatrics, the smoke and mirrors, there's a human underneath it but not with Kokichi. And if you're going to argue, well, Kokichi is a liar, so of course we never know his true ideology and desires. My dear, did you forget somebody? Or are you just pretending that you forgot? But more on her in part two of this video. For the time being, let's switch gears to talking about something positive, especially since I've been talking shit for 20 minutes and I'm pretty worn out. So, let's move on to an actually good character and some questions regarding her. Why should Angie have been the rival instead? Are there writing elements where Angie is actually worse than Kokichi? Other than the handling of a minority group? Well, let's take a look. Number one, Persona. Easy way to start us off. What's Angie's persona? Angie is an overenthusiastic optimist, an eternally happy soul who abandoned her abilities to feel almost any negative emotions in service of her religious zeal to God. She's dedicated in her devotion to him, and whatever he decides is best for her and the people around her. She's a charismatic, extroverted, and very friendly character, but she isn't without flaws. She's characterized as the selfish manipulator of her situation when push comes to shove, but while she will put herself first, she does what she does in order to benefit her group once her own needs and wants are met. And she is also determined to achieve what she wants at the time, but despite her interest in violence, never partakes in it herself. And she's persona isn't completely good, or completely evil. It manages to actually straddle the line and genuinely make her a morally grey character. More importantly, her persona is indeed her own. You'd be hard pressed to find another character in the series like her in enough ways to argue that she copy-pasted their characterization and only tweaked it a little. 
She is someone totally unique from anyone else in Danganronpa with her own voice and ideology. Angie is her own person, not only contributing to the sub-theme of logic versus emotion, but providing a very underutilized reversal of a tired and cliché trope. The religious zealot, Angie, is the logical individual, and the atheist, Tango, is fueled by her emotions. So yeah, Angie is honestly great with her persona, whether you love it or hate it. And even though I'm an atheist, I absolutely adore her. Number two, agency. Ha! No way will they be able to argue now. They already criticized that Kokichi just talks and said there's no agency in that. And all Angie ever does is talk. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Angie's speech serves her ideology. She isn't just saying, lol, gone to go kidnap everyone, and then he just does that. She manages to dig down into what everyone desires and considers safe very quickly and startlingly easily. She managed to break through to Himiko when nobody else could and manages to manipulate her to her side in a believable way. She starts by reaffirming that she understands the horrible situation and their worst fears and then tells them that they aren't alone in their plight and offers them God as a figurehead to believe in as a way of proving that they'll never go through anything alone. Much like real world religious figures trying to convert others. She uses her words expertly to build the trust between her and her classmates and keep it. While the class does distrust her a bit, it isn't due to the fact that she repeatedly acts like a total asshole to everybody around her. It's due to the fact that she's startlingly good at manipulation and changing a character's views within a short period of time. She recognizes that being openly awful to everybody would only hurt her plans, and they've also done her no wrong to justify acting badly. It's better to resolve her conflicts with diplomacy since she's looking to convert others. Had Kyo not slammed a sword into the back of her neck, she'd have likely managed a student council majority by chapter 4 and actually succeeded in stopping the killing game. Speaking of Korokyo slamming a sword into the back of Angie's neck, oh look, Angie did physical things that drove the plot, and more than just riding on a rock in the garden. Agreeing to help take down Monokuma in chapter 1? Oh, look at that. Yes. The setup of the student council? Yes. The organization of the Necronomicon ritual? Yes. The wax effigies, Himiko's magic show, her own marriage to Shuichi! Yes, 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 yes! Angie is a character that actually took action in the narrative and instigated the help that she needed. She's the one setting up the student council and organizing the ritual. In fact, it's in this that we see that Angie can not only perform her talent really well, but she performs Kokichi's talent better than he does! Number three. Motive. I did criticize Kokichi for having a bad goal and no motive. Angie has a similar goal, stop the killing game. Where the two differ is that stop the killing game as a goal feels like a natural part of Angie's ideology and is aided by her actions, which all serve this purpose. If everyone believes in God and his divine words through her, nobody will die because nobody will have the desire to kill. And in that is her motive. Angie's motive extends beyond it's the right thing to do. And she doesn't want people to die for her own agenda as well. More people who are alive means more people who can listen to her. More people who listen to her means more followers for God and means that she won't be lonely or forgotten. People will listen to her and she'll have power over them through being God's prophet. She never uses violence to exude her will, but shame is a powerful tool that she uses to achieve her goals when necessary and she does know when to give up for the day. She has multiple intersecting motives. I must stop the killing game because God deems it a horrible event, and God wishes that everyone was happy with him and me as his prophet. Angie's religious fanaticism gives her an edge over Kokichi because it gives her a pre motive and ideology to work from. It's compelling in that it's neither good nor evil. It's morally grey and up to the audience to decide if she is indeed on the right path of thinking, if her goal is noble but her methods are horrible, if her methods are good but serve a terrible goal, or if she truly is just selfish. Her character prompts thought. Maybe it is best to give in and put your faith in a higher power in a horrible situation like this, even if you don't really feel their presence. Maybe it's better to fight against the person promoting this. Maybe you shouldn't take sides until you get a better idea of the big picture and wait to play your hand. Maybe Mew will stop talking shit. Number four, wants and fears. Unfortunately, Angie's wants and fears aren't as well defined as other aspects of her character, but they're still better to define than... As said before, her goal is end the killing game, but she has a much more compelling reasoning behind that want, and thus her wants and desires feel much stronger. But she does also have the much larger wants outside of the killing game. Serve God. Leave my classmates to God's wisdom. 
marry Shuichi if the player does my free time events, etc. Angie's fears, however, are actually quite well defined and rewarded to the player for digging deeper into her character during the free time events. Angie's ultimate fear is loneliness and powerlessness. We see this during her third event. When Shuichi finally scolds her for overstepping his boundaries, Angie completely stops. We see her even remotely angry for the first time, and she excuses herself in order to sort out her emotions. She's never been told no by before by something that she actually wants. People make excuses and reasons to not fulfill her desires, but Shuichi's the first to tell her no. She does sort out her fears in a healthy way and doesn't try to touch Shuichi in ways he doesn't like again. Shuichi is also the first to treat her with respect for her. In turn, Angie quickly tries to marry Shuichi so she doesn't lose him as the only one who shows interest in both her and her god. It's a creative way for a character that doesn't outwardly express her emotions to still show her fears, and in a way that still indeed conveys this to the audience. Number 5. Conflicts and Connections Angie's conflict is clear and stems from the student council, although she had a few minor conflicts here and there before that event. Her conflict is the student council's formation restricted the freedom of those who weren't part of the council for the purposes of preventing another murder. The conflict presents the connections that Angie has, with Gonta joining up out of a genuine wish to protect all of his friends, and finding Angie's council the best way to achieve that, Himiko joining up because she wanted an extra layer of security and believes that Angie will give it to her, Tenko joining up to keep an eye on Himiko without Angie thinking something was suspicious, and Samuki and Kibo joining in order to round out the council's numbers and make this part of the show more interesting. Angie's connections make sense, and if she needs someone to specifically to accomplish a goal, she will usually talk to them about it first and actually present herself as someone friendly, approachable, and able to take responsibility for both herself and them. You know, the person I can buy people doing stuff for. This all connects back to her ability to lead the group. She has the markings of a protagonist. She's logical, charismatic, and fully capable of leading the group, all qualities previous protagonists have utilized as part of their characters. And those same qualities make wonderful foils to Shuichi and also make her an excellent rival. For while Shuichi is indeed a logical thinker, he is held back by his emotions. While Shuichi is charismatic, he is held back by his anxiety. And she is not held back by those things. The things holding her back are her lack of negative emotions and her over-enthusiasm. And she presents an interesting dilemma, too. You cannot prove that God does not exist, but it's also hard to prove that he does, too. It's a truth that Shuichi will never be able to prove, and a lie that Shuichi will never be able to disprove. This adds a layer of depth to the themes of lies versus truth, reality versus fiction, theism versus atheism. Angie is proven to be fully willing to suspect a friend of murder when everyone else's lives are on the line. She didn't even hesitate when there was a possibility that Himiko could be the culprit. Shuichi hesitated severely to pin Kaede as the culprit. She had to do most of that for him. You see how there's so much more contrast between the doom and gloom protagonist Shuichi and the happy-go-lucky Angie that was rich to be explored as a rivalry. How Yonaga could have easily, in a better universe, been Togami and Kamaya's successor. This would not be possible if her ideology were non-existent or inconsistent. It works because Angie remains consistent, because she has a core ideology that she believes in, because she has her own unique persona, because her conflicts and relationships, her wants and fears, and her motive make sense. Because Angie is, beneath everything, human. As a character, Kokichi completely fails to be a human being. His actions do not serve his greater goals and don't have any motives, and they exist purely to be contrarian to the rest of the group. Initially, I thought this was just a spot of bad writing, but it feels intentionally bad. I think I get what fans of Kokichi were saying now about not getting his character, but I don't think that I got the point that they wanted me to get. My conclusion was this. Kadaka could just throw something together that invoked the feeling of other characters, and even if they were fundamentally broken, people would still eat it up if it hit the notes of previous grades. Nobody is a perfect writer, but this strikes me as uncharacteristically bad to be unintentional. The writing is so scattershot. It's creating a message at conflict with itself. Kokichi does all of these horrible things, and then the narrative tries to pull, oh, he was a good guy all along, at the very end. For a writer like Kadaka, that can't be a mistake. Angie, on the other hand, 
despite the problematic representation of Polynesian people, does feel like a completed character with a motive, wants and fears, a persona, conflicts, and an ideology that drives her thoughts and actions. She feels like a completed character, and I still think she should have been Shuichi's rival, not Kohichi. She would have provided a second layer of themes to truth versus lies with theism versus atheism, and was more subtle with these themes. And she could have been the rival easily. She should have been the rival. And I'm not just saying that to please not. I genuinely believe that Angie was a better choice for Shuichi's rival. However, we do have one more major point to address. What if Kokichi is intentionally written to be a bag of lies? Is Kokichi intended as a character to be evil and surrounded by lies and never to discover what's hidden deep inside? Are the lies the point? Because if they are, there's another character his superior that wishes to have her turn in the ring with him. Coming in part two. Right now. Smokey and Kibo joining in order to round out the council's numbers and make up.